Mike Demerges here along with Ernie Acorsi, the former GM of the New York Giants, of course, also with the Cleveland Browns and Baltimore Colts. But Ernie, it's hard to believe we're coming up on 20 years since 9-11 and the Giants uh, were in the air the morning of 9-11. What do you recall from them going back 20 years ago now? Well, Mike, uh, you know, we played a Monday night game in open Denver Stadium. was new that then. And we flew back and landed at Newark. Um, there, there's some ironic things that we didn't find out. We flew United Airlines, so that's how we found this out. But we didn't find this out until later. So we landed at the gate. The buses pick up. It's 8 in the morning. So we're going. The, the football operation is going back to the stadium. Um, and we load the buses. But the traveling party, the, the Maras, the Tishes, the broadcast team, and so forth, they went through the terminal because they were get their cars to the parking lot or car services to go home. And we found out later that when they when they took the jetway out of the gate, the gate next to it was Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville. So they walked right by all those people who were to crash in that plane and the terrorists. Um, we we went back to the stadium, and you know I still had my binoculars from the night before, which I always took to the press box. And Pat Halen, the PR director told me that, um, he says a plane hit the world trade center. Well, a, there had been a helicopter that kind of ran into the statue of Liberty just before that. I, I figured it was something like that, a private plane. So Dave Gettleman, who was the pro personnel director at the time, we walked out into the parking lot and I'm looking at the uh, smoke coming out of one of the towers. The second plane hadn't hit yet because, uh, I'm, I'm about to see it. It was the, you know, the dark gray of the United Airlines at that time is banking right around it. And I said to Gettleman, I said, you know, that's strange that, that the, an airliner would come that close to the towers in view of, of what just happened. And we still thought it was nothing but a, a, a freak accident. And I actually saw that plane bank, but then it entered from the south, so I didn't see it at the tower. So I walked back in the office, and that's when Pat Hanlon told me that what had happened again and that they were airliners, and now we knew, you know, it was very, very serious. And for, you know, for people that don't know, after a team plays an out-of-city game, they, they pack up the equipment, and they don't stay in town. They, they fly back home uh, overnight, right. as you guys did. So everybody's, you know, basically spent the whole night on the plane, and you're just, you know, looking to, to, to start your, your Monday. And from the Meadowlands at the time, you, you have a perfect view for our national audience of the New York City skyline. So as you're as you're watching this and, and, and thinking, you know, what's going on, what, what's happening in the office there uh, for well, the New York we, Giants? We sent, we sent everybody home. Uh, and, you know, 99 percent of the people live in Jersey or Westchester County. Uh, I lived in Manhattan. So did Pat Hanlon. And so did um, one of our clubhouse guys. That guy had been there forever. Uh, Julius Harai, who was we called the commish. So the three of us we could not get back into the city. Um, so we, we, uh, we had to stay. Well, I would have stayed anyway to work, but as the, as the coaches did, but, uh, I had to spend the night there. I slept on my couch and we could not get back in until the next day and getting back in the next day took about six hours because it was so jammed. Um, but you know, that night, I mean, we still didn't know whether there would be a follow up if something else was going to happen. Because the other, you know, after we saw, experienced our situation in New York, bang, bang, the other two planes had incidents. So we didn't know, you know, if this was going to be an extended attack. Um, but it was, I mean, you know, you're in, you're in shock. And of course, we had to deal with now a scheduling situation. Uh, we had played, we were supposed to play the Packers the following Sunday. We heard all kinds of rumors that they were going to send us to Green Bay. Um, uh, if they played and Jason Seahorn was the Giants player rep and I guess they had players that heard it too and he came up and said we just had a vote we're not playing so you can inform the league office that we're not playing in Green Bay we're not playing anywhere we are not playing the Jets had just announced they would play and we not because they announced that but Seahorn was steadfast and what the players felt I relayed that to the league office and not that long after that uh they postponed the whole schedule. 
And, and, and while, while you're watching this happen, uh, Dick Lynch, who was former Giant and, of course, a broadcaster with the New York Giants at the time, he had his son in the building as well, as, as I recall. And this must have been a horrific thing for him to watch and for him to go through. Yeah, and, you know, he was one of the people who walked right by that gate um, and, and because he went home. And, I, you know, that was a terrible experience because God, Dick was a, a wonderful, wonderful man. Now, Tom Coughlin wasn't our coach. Jim Fossil was, but Tom Coughlin had a son in that building, too, who got out. And his daughter had gotten a hold of him. He, his cell phone worked, and he, he said, well, we're just told that it's in a certain floor and we're okay. And his daughter said, get out of the building. She was screaming at him on the cell phone to get out of the building, and thank God he did. Um, Tom told me that story later and Tom was on a practice field coaching at Jacksonville and he was, you know, he, he gets a call from his daughter and he's got to live through that too. It was, you know, it was, a, it was, you say it's 20 years. I mean, it seems like it was yesterday. It's raw in your lifetime. And we, you know, I lived in Manhattan. You could smell the smoke and you could see some smoke for weeks, but we could see the smoke directly from our practice field and from our front door. We walked out of the stadium office. Uh, so it was right in front of us uh, the whole time we were there. It was, I mean, you just felt violated, you know, when you were that close to it. The whole country did. You know, there was another side note here. The media that had covered that game, the Bronco game, uh, the giant Bronco game, obviously all, all flights were canceled. And they luckily were able to rent a car. Now you're going to walk into the airport with all this frenzy going on saying, I want to rent a car to drive off in Newark and from, from Denver. It, 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 they, at first they, the guy said, no way at all. I can't, I don't even have a car for you. Somehow they were able to talk him into it. So six media guys, actually they weren't guys. There were two women and four guys. Um, Paul Schwartz was one of them. It, and they, they got in a car and drove nonstop the alternated driving, except to get gasoline and grab a sandwich somewhere at a convenience store, straight through to Newark, were able to get a car to get home. That's how they got home. And, and Ernie, at the, at the time of the building's collapse, I mean, you obviously remember where you were. You Were you with the, the, the Mara family at that time uh, and as these, as these buildings went down? And, you know, explain and share the feeling as many Americans felt at the time. Most of us were watching it on CNN in horror. And then before you know it, these towers incredibly collapsed and it was a big collective thump in the in the heart of America and really around the world, the free world anyway. Yeah, and it was, you know, it, it the, the uh, setbacks, the emotional setbacks were in stages because even when, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm no expert on anything engineering, but even when they hit and you saw this smoke coming, you didn't think that the buildings were going to come down. You know, you figured there was damage and so forth. And, uh, and, and then, then you heard one building collapse and then the other one collapsed. Now, the only people that were still at the stadium were the coaches, uh, the assistant coaches and a couple of us, the executive football people, because they sent the players home. As I said, we sent all the employees and staff home because we didn't know, we didn't know what was going to happen. They wanted to be home with their families. The Maris had gone home and the Tishes. So we, we were just there and we heard reports that, uh, the stadium was going to be attacked. I mean, you heard a thousand rumors. Even the police called my office and said, look, we've got a, a report. We don't think it's true um, of, of a truck with bombs that we're, we're heading up the turnpike towards the stadium. And, you know, I, so I said, should we evacuate? He said, not until I call back. And then they found out that that wasn't true. So we stayed at the stadium all night. Um, but it's just... It, and exactly one week later to the day, we took two buses of players and some coaches uh, into the city, into Ground Zero, and walked through Ground Zero. We also stopped and visited the headquarters, the police headquarters downtown. The, the chief of police for the Southern District of Manhattan was Michael Esposito, and we became friends for life. He... He led us, and this, Mr. Marrow was, was with us, 
and we walked through Ground Zero, and the volunteers were there. And then we, we visited fire departments and we visited police stations. That's when it hit us. Now, by that time, we already knew we were playing Kansas City the following week on the road. And that's when it hit us that we had to win this game because the volunteer workers, the police, the fire department, they were every one of them screaming to the players, you got to win this game. You got to win this game. And you realize that that might be the only relief for at least sports fans to go home and watch the football game Sunday. Um, and of course, we had to go play that game in Kansas City. Now, it wasn't as dramatic as Piazza's home run, but we went out there and, you know, that's a pretty rabid fan base. And when we came out for the kickoff, they gave us a standing ovation because we were from New York. And when we won the game and left the field, they gave us a standing ovation on her up. And when I walked in that locker room, it was like we had just won the Super Bowl. I mean, the players were celebrating because they felt so much pressure. And I've always been so respectful of the players and of coaching staff and Jim Fossil somehow keeping that team grounded for those two weeks to be able to get ready to go play a tough football team in a, in a tough venue. They still had to get, get their job done, and they were carrying a tremendous amount of pressure to represent the city of New York, our area, which had been so violated and wounded during this experience. It was important to our fans that, that we won that game, and we felt it. And I, the way, where it really hit me the most, as I said, was a week later when we walked through Ground Zero. You mentioned Jim Fossil, and I think back then, back then, I, I remember a, a a clip of Michael Strahan getting nervous and wanting to come off the practice field when he heard sirens going off, and I, and I have the image of Jim Fossil trying to calm him down. Talk about his steadiness during that time that that he he led to the team. He, he had a tremendous uh, disposition, you know. I, I think if I watched this golf tournament recently with Patrick Cantlay and I, I look at that poise he's got and that calm, I'm a nervous wreck in a game. I'm pacing around like a maniac. Okay. So, and, and, uh, Jim had a lot of that. Jim, you, you got a lot of solace from Jim because, you know, he'd walk down. I remember, uh, when we were getting ready for the championship game against Minnesota, uh, and you know, they had all pros at every position. I mean, they, they had, you know, Moss and they had Smith running back, Chris Carter. I mean, they were loaded with talent. And I, that week, all I, could, I couldn't even sleep. I kept picturing them mm-hmm. scoring touchdowns against us. And Fossil and Jim Fox, our defensive co- John Fox, our defensive coordinator, were walking down the hall. And I said to me, relax, we may just shut them out. Whoa, we did. really? We may just shut them out. And, and we did, 41 to nothing. I said, you guys are nuts. So, uh, you know, he had that calm about him. Um, he didn't get excited. I mean, we won a game, a big game, and especially that one, he was excited. But, but he was always calming, and he he somehow kept, you know, the, the players' perspective. I mean, we we had to go play an a NFL football game against a team that was very good and in a tough stadium to play in. So we we had a tall order. You know, it wasn't going to be a ceremony. It was going to be a tough physical football game. And it was close, but we prevailed really through toughness. Uh, and and uh, he, he did a marvelous job. So did the players on keeping focus that week. Uh, historically, when uh, President Kennedy was shot, uh, Pete Rozelle always said he regretted playing football on the weekend he was shot. Uh, at the time, that was brought up. Should we play? Should we not play? Do you remember the discussions as, as far as what was going on with the league office as far as playing the following week or not? Well, I, I just know from our end because the Jets were going to play on the road. Right. We were going to play at home. So there were all kinds of rumors. Now, you know, I didn't pick up the phone and call every five minutes because they were having important meetings in the league office with Commissioner Tagley and his staff. And But we had heard, number one, that uh, that we may play and we may go and play in Green Bay, which, you know, would have been a tremendous competitive disadvantage for us. Uh, we had heard that the games you know would be postponed. The Kennedy thing did come up. Um, I remember that vividly. I was 22 years old, so it wasn't like I was a baby when that happened. Um, but, and, and the, and Pete Rochelle always did say that, but, uh, that he regretted that decision, but 
you know, there was nothing was televised, but they played. They, they didn't televise anything that in 1963. But you know, we heard all these rumors, and we were we were all relieved when you know when the decision came down. It came down quickly on Monday that uh, the games would be postponed. We played that game after the 16th week, uh, which was a relief. And I remember that Sunday was almost. Uh, it was like a, a day that you just never think you're going to live. It's a Sunday afternoon, uh, a week later, when the games were postponed. And Dick Stockton, who lived in Manhattan, who was a, C- a CBS or Fox broadcaster at the time, was off, naturally. And Joel Bussert, who was the vice president of player personnel from the NFL, also lived in Manhattan. And I, we just took a long walk through the city. And the city was virtually abandoned. Um, there weren't very many people in the city, but but I remember walking down Park Avenue. It must have been 65, 70 degrees. Perfect day. It was surreal. You didn't, you know, it was a Sunday in the fall. And for all of us, you know, I didn't even have a recollection of what Sundays in the fall were like being off. Um, and, it, you know, there was no football. You were still in shock. It just was the strangest, strangest thing. And I can recall that so vividly. The question always came came up, you know, when is it okay to get back to normal? When it is okay because sports is such, and we've seen it now with this pandemic, a, a, a sense of normalcy. And um, at the time, a lot of you know the teams in New York had a lot of pressure on them um, to to bring to perform under very insecure times. And did any of the players feel the pressure to just um, you know perform in that field? Maybe some didn't want to. They just felt very. Uh, depressed about what was going on or, or scared in, in all honesty, as many people were at that time. Well, you know, there, in 63, and I remember this, well, I was a sports writer. I was a rookie sports writer. And I remember this. There were, there were fist fights. There was, there was a, a famous fist fight uh, in the Eagles locker room over players did not want to play. Uh, and, and Mike Ditka made one of the greatest catch runs in the history of the league where he Knock, must have knocked eight people over running for a touchdown in Pittsburgh, which was his hometown. He was uh, playing for the Bears. And the people have said that it was his, uh, you know, it was the emotion of the day. He was one of the players that really protested playing uh, when Kennedy was, was uh, he was a Democrat. He was a Catholic. He, he, he it felt he took it personally. But there were all kinds of controversies and fights over those, uh, you know, there were a lot of players that did not want to play. Um, in baseball in 1968, when, when, uh, Robert Kennedy was, was assassinated, uh, uh, I think there were a couple of players that ended up being traded because they refused to play and the players punished them by trading them. So there were all kinds of emotions and we avoided that, thankfully. Uh, but I will tell you this, that, and I, I mean, I'm an avid sports fan like you are. I can't speak for people who, who are interested in sports, but I think if, even if you're marginally in, interested in sports, a, a ball game, a sporting event, which seems like it's insignificant, is really a, a great escape. I mean, and I remember when my dad when my dad passed away, and his funeral was on a a Saturday, and that day it, it was in Hershey, Pennsylvania. That day when we came home from the funeral, uh, it's you know it's obviously a, a terrible day for anybody. Uh, Mike Schmidt hit four home runs. And I have to tell you that that helped. Mm. You know, it, that helped. I, I was, remember sitting on the couch and watching this game. Uh, not that the game meant that much to me at that point. It's just that it was a great escape, great relief to concentrate on something like that. And I always remembered that. And that had an impact on me because when, when you're going through any kind of even personal tra- tragedy, sports – if you're a sports fan, uh, and I guess if, if you're not, even the theater or whatever, a show, a movie, a book even, uh, can be such a place to go where to get your mind off of the suffering you're going through. And certainly as, as the season went on, at what point do you think things were somewhat normal? By October, would you say, for the team, as, as possibly could be? It took a while. I, I it, it took a, a good while. I mean, you know, when you get into the heat of battle, now you know everybody's playing under such enormous pressure. Every season means everything, 
uh, you know, you're all playing for your jobs, really, your practice, whatever you're doing, you're coaching for your jobs, you're general managing for your jobs. So you have a lot at stake. It's your career. So once you get into the heat of battle, uh, that you're back into competition, you're back in a game. So we're coming off a Super Bowl and we're having an up and down year. And that's a bunch of heartbreakers. And so we had a very emotional season just on the field alone. I'd, I'd say within three or four weeks, you're, you're back to, you look at, I'm not over it yet. I don't think anybody who experienced it is over, over that incident yet, but at least you're, you're, you know, you're back to focusing on your job. And and certainly the the Yankees and baseball. It's, it seemed like baseball took a little more precedent over football, or, or gets maybe credited a little more uh, than the, than the Giants or the Jets at, at the time. You had the Piazza home run. Now we know you love baseball a, as a sport, and certainly uh, the Yankees made that run through the playoffs and you know took the it took the D backs to Game Seven. Talk about the significance of as as just a sports fan and as as a sports person wa- watching what the watching the Piazza home run and watching what the Yankees did uh, with, with the D backs going to Game Seven. Well, b- baseball did take a little bit of a precedent, I think, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they play every day, so once they once they started playing, it wasn't like there was a week of inactivity. That's number one. Number two, they were going towards the climax of their season. Uh, they were going down the stretch towards the World Series, and then they get in. The Yankees get into the World Series. The Yankees had that, you know, that famous moment with with President Bush and the the uh, one of the worker, one of the volunteer workers, standing on the mound together. Um, and I, I remember the great line from Jeter that Bush went into the private area in the back of the stadium and warmed up to make sure he could reach the plate. And uh, he was bouncing some pitches, and Jeter said, to him, "Mr. President, you better not bounce it because they're going to pull you." <laughs> and, and, uh, but baseball did, and then of course that moment of Piazza's homer, which I wa- I watched that that night. Uh, yeah, that's tough to duplicate. We were playing September games, and you know we had a long season to go, so we weren't at the point of the pinnacle of the season like they were. And like I said, they play every day, so. Uh, it was a little different then, I think, for, for them. Uh, but at least for us, that Sunday, that, that was an emotional day for us. It was important that we, especially, especially having gone down at Ground Zero exactly one week later and hearing the reaction from the, from the, the volunteers and the police department and the fire department. What, was it worse in person than from what we saw on TV? Yeah, I mean, it was. It, it was, I mean, when you saw all the debris and smelled it, it it's the smells and the sounds. and uh, I mean, it, it just looked like it had just happened. The demolition and watching what people were going through. Um, all those, God bless those people that, that went through that and worked. And so many of them have got, been sick since then that you read about. Um you can you can never forget that. I remember um, that at, what what happened after we were done. The bus took the players back to, to the stadium, but I just decided to, to walk to see if I could walk home, and that was a long way for me. I lived in the Upper East Side, so about halfway, uh, and they they had given us those yellow helmets to wear down there. And uh, you really had nowhere to give it back. I'd have everybody to give it back, so I, I ha- was carrying it. And uh, about halfway back, I flagged that because you couldn't get a taxi. I flagged the cab down, and I get in the cab, and and um, when we got to my home, my apartment, he said, "I can't charge you. You 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 have that helmet. You must have been working." I said, "No, I didn't work. I uh, I can't I can't be a hypocrite." I said, "No, I, I want to pay for the fare." I said. Uh, I'm grateful that I was able to get the cab, but no, I, I had this yellow helmet, but I was not a volunteer worker. So, I mean, that's how the, you know, that's how the people were then. And you'd walk down the street in Manhattan and people, you know, that naturally have briefcases going to work or purses, uh, the bags of some kind around the, you know, most everybody was on their shoulders now with little American flags sticking out. But that's, that's what the, 
unity in the in the experience was the spirit was at that time. What would I remember? I remember going down about a week after the attacks, not to ground zero, but clo- close to it. And I remember the silence and not hearing people talking, not hearing a horn blowing. Um, and I remember getting a sore throat because of the smoldering smell that, yeah. that was in the air at the time. And I'm, I'm sure you recall that as well, walking around Manhattan. It was eerily quiet, as I recall. And I'm sure you experienced the same thing living in Manhattan. Yeah, it was. I mean, everybody was different for a while. But, but being down there, we were able to get into Ground Zero because we were escorted by the police, our buses. But you're so right about the smell. I mean, I could smell it in my apartment 70 blocks away, uh, let alone when we went down to Ground Zero seven days after it, it, you know, the disaster, the tragedy. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. It was, it was a quietness all over, all over the area, particularly in the city. Well, Ernie, it's been 20 years since then, so uh, you, you, you led a team through a historic part of American history, and uh, thank you for sharing these memories with us. Um, and it's something that I hope a day for many people they never forget, and if they weren't born yet and they, they don't know about it, I hope they respect the day and respect the heroes that you passed along the way with the Giants at the time that were working so feverishly to try and save lives at Ground Zero. Well, I guess if, if you weren't born or don't remember it, it's a lot like, like Pearl Harbor was for us. And the more you read about it and heard about it and, and studied it over the years, the more you realized what the impact was, but there was nothing like experience in it. And, there's, and there was absolutely nothing like experience in it in New York. And I'm sure people in Western Pennsylvania and the Pentagon were the same way. Uh, it seems like I said, it seems like yesterday, but we'll never forget it. That, that experienced it. Uh, it's been a pleasure being with you, Mike. It's, it's always good talking to you.